Hi everyone from One Route, I'm Jeffrey Ross and you're watching the One Route Roundup, the show that spotlights individuals making a positive difference in the telecom industry. Today we're joined by Timo Vignonpa, currently the owner and as his profile says, maestro of both Amatel Corporation and Aurora International Telecommunications. He holds a degree in electrical engineering from the University of Waterloo and has been known to dabble a little in the business of outer space. Timo, thanks for joining the show. How are you, sir? I am Grant Jeffrey. Good to see you again. I have to ask, as I ask all my guests, where in the world are you today? I am in beautiful Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. I like it. How In my basement. I was about to say, hey, is it still snowing up there? You know, from Texas, everything's north, so we, we don't get out much. You know, even if you move side to side, it's, you know, it's up there. <laughs> we actually had snow about two weeks ago. Uh, today, it, we're in the mid-50s, about 13 degrees Celsius. Uh, next week, we're looking at nice uh, mid-20s Celsius, so nah, 70 degree Fahrenheit nah, weather. Talking. Now it's time yeah. for us to leave Texas and come up there. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of blue bonnet season, you don't want to leave. Yeah, you know, I, I found it interesting that uh, I got a message from a mutual friend, Rob Chapman, if you're watching. Thank you for sending pictures of the bluebells that were in bloom. And uh, it happened to be same time as the blue bonnets. So I don't know if bluebells and blue bonnets are are uh, in the same family, but apparently they bloom at the same time. You know, uh, the only bluebell I know is an ice cream, but now I've got some proof of some amazing pictures of bluebells out of England, but we'll see. Timo, uh, I've got to ask, you've been in telecom for, for a little bit, right? Just for a little bit of time. What got you into the telecom industry? Uh, well, it's, it's, 39 years. Uh, next year will be my 40th year in telecom. So I started after graduating the University of Waterloo with my engineering degree back in 1983. Um, I, I was always interested in telecommunications. I was, it, when I was a kid, I was a, an electronics buff. I used to take apart TVs. I used to build my own radios. Um, I hoarded old uh, amateur radio magazines, you know, so I learned circuitry at an early age and I was studying electrical engineering and what I specialized in was actually RF and, uh, and, and telecom. So then uh, going to the University of Waterloo, we had co-op programs. It's, it's a co-op university. So I had a chance to work in various sectors as I was going through school. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I realized pretty quickly, yeah, you know, telecom is where I wanted to be. So I immediately got hired uh, when I graduated by CNCP Telecommunications, which was owned half by CN Rail, half by CP Rail. Mm. They were the ones that provided competition against the majority of telephone companies here in Canada, which was Bell Canada majority. Um, and, and CNCP was great because it was a nationwide network. They had the Telex network. They were just putting in fiber at the time and they were hiring engineers to be the future leaders of the company. So they gave us intense technical training on everything that was in the network. But instead of bringing us to headquarters to be engineers, they put us out to be frontline supervisors to be, learn how to manage people. Okay. So I actually, my first job was running Southwestern Ontario, which is Windsor, Sarnia, Chatham. Windsor's across the river from Detroit. Uh, Sarnia is across from uh, Port Huron, in Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the three biggest sectors of the Canadian economy are down there. Automobiles in Windsor, oil in Sarnia, and agriculture in Chatham, Kent. Huh? Um, so I had 14 techs working for me, three exchanges, three mechanical telex exchanges. And we were putting the second fiber ever that CNCP had through the Toronto Detroit railway tunnel. So it was a whole lot of fun. So yeah. it, that yeah. was my start. And I've been in telecom ever since, as you say, with Aurora and Amitel, running my own companies now for 30 years this year. Wow. That's amazing. That's been, you know, the area you just described in Canada sounds, it sounds like the Texas of Canada, <laughs> as far as the industries go. <laughs> I tell you, you make, yeah, I guess you do make cars in Texas, don't you? They do now. Yeah. You know, they, I think they've got a Toyota plant here somewhere. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, Texas is big. There's, there's a lot of places I haven't been that I still need to go, but we'll call your area the Texas of Canada. <laughs> the I guess we could say we're the Canada of the U.S., maybe? No. The border crossing between Windsor and Detroit is probably one of the busiest in the world, if not the busiest, and the amount of trade that goes across because of just-in-time delivery between the auto plants on both sides mm. uh, is incredible. I would imagine so. Yeah, so we, we got to talk a little bit about stir shaking and we're not going to get into the, the nuts and bolts of that by any means, but Timo, with you being in North America and, and stir shaking is kind of being, I'm sure people are sick and tired of hearing about it. Let's be honest, but stir shaking seems to always be the discussion point with North America. As someone who terminates traffic outside of North America, what do you hear from your clients in regards to the need for call validation? Uh, well, actually, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's a simple answer. <laughs> and it, it, it very much comes to the fact that my main business is international termination. Mm -hmm. And that goes about uh, the last paying job I had before starting my own company was I was VP network at ACC Long Distance. Okay. Uh, and we had operations in the United States, in Canada, in, in the United Kingdom, and in Australia. Um, and when I left ACC after five years, started my own companies, I knew I wanted to pick a niche where I wasn't competing against the main telcos, the oligopoly. Right. In Canada, Bell, Telus, Rogers, very similar to if you're in the United States trying to compete against AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. So I chose international because nobody the majors in canada don't have network outside of canada okay how this ties back into stir shaking is the fact that i don't have any local numbering resources mm. uh i wholesale to other phone companies predominantly in canada now but when i started actually i had customers overseas uh, in hong kong in china in the united states i have my 214 license to operate in the u.s um so i don't have any any local numbering resources i don't terminate traffic in canada it all terminates wow. overseas so any attestation that has to be done is done by my customers mm. uh, because they would have access to the local numbering resources. They would have to put the, the stamp, the certificate on there saying, okay, we attest this number. I don't know because I don't know the local number. Right. I got you. And then yeah. when I terminate overseas, I use wholesale carriers again, right, predominantly uh, Tata, but I have used uh, France Telecom, Deutsche Telecom, uh, most of the majors. So um, it takes a few hops before it terminates. Uh, well, in my case, I go direct. Okay. Oh, uh, even better. Yeah. You, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the only way you can provide the quality. Like you have to, in this day and age, quality matters. Uh, and that goes to a pivot I did about 10 years ago. Instead of trying to compete on price, mm -hmm. which is a no-win situation. Um, and then you can't control the routing uh, and you can't control the quality and you, it leads you open to a lot of fraud. Uh, it's better just to go directly with a major wholesale carrier and terminate. Right. No, that's good. So there hasn't, you know, one thing I should say, and I know we've had this, uh, we've had this discussion in the past and I found it really intriguing. Uh, and it has to do with the decline in voice because of OTT apps. Um, and I know a lot of us take for granted good internet connection right but there's still countries out there that might not have as good of a connection so as most would say voice is declining due to ott apps from your perspective how important are voice calls on more of a global scale you know for the for the countries that don't have that great connectivity uh, i remember the first time we had this conversation a couple of years back and uh it, it, it's very interesting. There's a document or uh, a website, Telegeography, that has been tracking global international voice traffic for probably 20 years. They are the Bible. They are the main source. Mm. Uh, and they clearly identified that as of 2015, if you take all the traffic from all the telcos around the world, um, we reached peak voice. And it's been declining ever since 2015. Right. And it's quite clear that that has been driven by the rise of Skype, WhatsApp, uh, sure. and you can list them off. There's now so many uh, ways of communicating voice outside of that. 
Uh, we're, however, we're doing it right now. <laughs> we're doing it right now. However, um, if you take the minutes that are on all those OTT apps and add them to the telephone numbers, we're actually still growing by 15% a year. It's just, it's no longer showing up on the telephone company's network. Uh, an interesting sideline from that is I've been at this game for, like I say, 40 years. I've been running my own international company for 30. Uh, initially, when I started, if you looked at the traffic profile of who, what my customers were using, from Canada, you'd see the top 10 countries would typically be where our immigration patterns came from. So it was England, France, uh, Netherlands, Germany. Um, and then it shifted more towards you know, where, where the other immigrants were coming from, let, let's say in the 2000, 2010 timeframe, Philippines, Vietnam, okay. uh, and Somalia. Now, if I look at my top 10, it's Algeria, oh. Morocco, Haiti, definitely. Right. Um, and the clear thing is, those are countries that do not have very good internet infrastructure. There, there you go. <laughs> and so anywhere where the, where the uh, internet is, yeah, all that traffic has migrated over to the OTT apps. In the areas that do not have the good internet infrastructure, yeah, no, that still goes over the phone companies networks. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of times we 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 take that internet connection for granted. That sometimes, as an industry, we might lose sight of the countries that are dependent on voice, uh, voice call. Well, as you said earlier, voice is still very important. It's how it's delivered, and it and it sounds to me like sometimes. Uh, we do. We forget about the the other areas of the world that still need it. Timo, I mean, I, I was in an area of New Mexico that had zero connectivity, not not just Internet, but zero cell connectivity. <laughs> so I always hear, you know, the push of of OTT apps or 5G, 6G, whatever. And I and I thought to myself, you know, there's areas of the world. There's areas of the United States that have. Nothing. I mean, don't break down there because there's no, you're going to have to learn how to do smoke signals. <laughs> yes. But yeah, that's, and, that's intriguing though. Uh, the way, the way that has changed over the years. Well, there's an unfortunate uh, thing happening is that that actually will probably in the short term get worse before it gets better. Um, if I think about a lot of the ISP infrastructure, now we're getting away from, from voice telecom, uh, but that was built on copper cable plant. That was built on DSL. So in major cities, you, 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 with broadband migrating to cable company offerings on, uh, over their uh, cable modems, um, a lot of that cable plant, the, the old copper cable plant, especially in rural areas, was never properly maintained because that, that could survive 100 years if it's properly maintained. If you don't maintain it, it deteriorates very rapidly and you can no longer put a proper DSL signal on it. To the point where now a lot of it is being abandoned. AT&T is no longer supporting uh, DSL. And you're going to see, in, especially in the rural areas, you're not going to be able to get an ISP that will give you a DSL anymore. They don't mm -hmm. have cable plant. And until satellite internet gets there, um, they really don't have a whole lot of options. That's intriguing. Yeah. You know, that's... Uh... That kind of leads me into the, the next thing. We, we've been talking about collaboration a lot on this show and, and working together, you know, country to country, telco to telco, supplier to supplier. Do you see a good amount of collaboration in the industry as far as in the effort to fight fraud? Uh, you know, do you see good collaboration or do you see improvement in I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you this, in, in my opinion, and this kind of dabbles with this, with this space. Uh, we hear that the same fraud types over and over and over. Uh, and there seems to be other industries that collaborate well to accomplish a goal, such as space. It's not just a U.S. centric program. It's a global program. There are more than one country at the International Space Station. And I find it intriguing that with collaboration, we can put a rover on Mars, but we can't get rid of SIM boxes. So, <laughs> but do you, from your perspective, do you see collaboration occurring or do you think there's more room for improvement? Uh, both. I, I see collaboration, absolutely. Uh, but there's always room for improvement. Um, 
if I go to some of the organizations that I'm a member of, uh, one, I'm a member of the I3 forum, which initially started off, if I'm not mistaken, 10, 15 years ago as an attempt by the major carriers that carry the bulk of the, of, of the international traffic. So the, we're talking the Orange and the AT&T and Telstra mm -hmm. um, to say, hey, we've got a, we've got a problem here. Um, and they, they have ways of fighting fraud. And one of the things that they do is they really try and share the traffic amongst themselves. So I was accepted as a, a friend of the i3 forum because I'm just a little one person co company, but uh, I can share in their best practices. I can share in their, their technical meetings. Uh, so there's collaboration happening that way. Uh, the other one, which I know that uh, uh, GBSD and um, and your sister companies are members of is is the RAG, the Risk and Assurance Group. Right. Um, and at a grassroots level, there's that's a huge amount of collaboration there of, of fraud professionals getting together and saying, "Hey, we can do this better. We can share information." Yeah. If I go back to my roots of when I was at ACC, uh, I was VP Network. I had informal connections to my peers at other uh, similar sized phone companies and we absolutely shared information <laughs> we, we we you know when we were being hit with fraud one of the things is you don't want to admit yeah we got hit with fraud but if you share the numbers and, and you're blocking this with each other mm -hmm. uh, you stop it from mitigating throughout the industry so the, you know, 25 years ago yeah we had that majors have it I don't know if the majors would have it, but uh, it, it's definitely still there. Can it be better? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that is good. That's a really good point. Well, Timo, we are we are approaching the part of the show that we want to help the audience know more who Timo is. <laughs> and I, I think you'll you'll agree that. In interactions day to day in business or in as we go to conferences, uh, business meetings, you know, shake hands and you have the 10 minute conversation. Uh, you know, if it doesn't carry on past that, you really don't get to know who somebody is. Uh, so the scientists over at the late show with Stephen Colbert came up with a questionnaire that supposedly will tell the audience exactly who you are. Oh, now, the, the, uh, our own scientists in the one route labs have tweaked it just a little bit, but for the most part, you know, the same. So it's 15 questions. Timo, are you ready to be known? Uh, I'm a pretty private person. I don't know if I want to be known, but okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try this experiment. Uh, you got this. All right, Timo. What is the best sandwich? The best sandwich? Montreal smoked meat. Oh, so it's, it's a... Uh, it's a brisket similar to, to corned beef, but it's much better uh, with mustard on rye. So Ooh, I like it. What is one thing that you own that you should really throw out? All the records of my company that I've had for the last seven years. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> what is the scariest animal? A skunk. <laughs> we just had one in the backyard the other night oh my lord you know that's that's one animal that uh you'll hit the brakes fast if you come up on it <laughs> yes okay timo apples or oranges apples that is correct <laughs> you know why why you can't put peanut butter on an orange why not <laughs> I guess you could. Doesn't taste as good as peanut butter in an apple. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. <laughs> Have you ever asked somebody for their autograph? Yes. As recently as uh, a month ago. Yeah. Who, who did you, uh, or I should say, did you get it? I did. We, my wife and I were, were out to dinner at a place called A Burb in Air. And it turns out our waitress had just gotten back from film school in uh, New York City. And uh, she was auditioning for a lot of parts in, in Toronto. And I asked her for her autograph. I says, one day this will be worth something. There you go. I like it. <laughs> what is your favorite action movie? Oh, favorite action movie. That's very interesting. I don't normally watch a lot of action movies. I'm going to go Die Hard. 
the Christmas classic. They, oh, well, now let's maybe go into a whole nother uh, video series. Is it a Christmas movie or not? You know, <laughs> absolutely it is. We watch it every year. And there seems to be a debate every Christmas, uh, you know, in our neck of the woods of is Die Hard a Christmas movie or not? <laughs> or is it just a, a cl cult classic that's shown at Christmas? <laughs> we'll leave that for another time. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite smell? My wife, uh, you know, just, when she snuggles it, up in your hair. I was going to say yeah. to Timo's wife, we're going to make sure that you watch this. He was not, uh, you know, told to say that. That's good brownie points. <laughs> What's your least favorite smell? And don't the say skunk. your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the skunk that was in my backyard. What, uh, what was your first cell phone that you owned? The first one that I owned was a Motorola car phone that was in uh, that was in my company vehicle when I was still at ACC. Uh, that was the, the so that was actually pro company provided. So then the first one that I personally had probably would have been a uh, a Nokia, yeah. an indestructible Nokia phone that had the snake game on it. Yeah, I, I remember that. I've forgotten yeah. about that game. <laughs> Do you prefer flat or sparkling? uh crown royal <laughs> we'll go with it <laughs> coffee or tea coffee definitely that, black that's uh definitely the, both of those are the right answer <laughs> you know we actually i need to I, i've got black rifle coffee company in my oh. uh, mug today the silencer smooth version um uh, i need to ship you some of that see what you think you know excellent we'll we'll, we'll take care of that what is the most used app on your phone? Uh, email. There you go. Okay. I, I actually try not to use my phone as, as I, I'm more on my computer than my phone. I try actively not to use it very much. That, that's good. I think that's healthy. You know, any more these days is definitely healthy. Yep. Uh, if you have one song to listen to for the rest of your life, and only one, what song would that be? Lord. Uh, well, I don't know if this counts as a song. It would be uh, probably either Beethoven's Ninth or Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Uh, I love yeah. them both. I, I'll actually be different and say Beethoven's Seventh. That's good. You know, I was reading the other day, Beethoven 14th. Uh, so this is around the time that he was deaf, completely deaf. And uh, I think it was Schumann, Schumann, that was quoted as saying, after he listened to it, he said, after this, what else is left to create? Which is an amazing thing to think about. A, a person that no longer even got to hear this piece of work that was able to write it. Uh, yep. Yeah. It, it's a fascinating story in, in general. So... What number am I thinking of? Nine. No. You're getting there, though. Uh, describe the rest of your life in five words. I plan on living to 100. We'll, we'll, we'll count it. <laughs> All right, Timo, you are now a known man to the audience. I appreciate you doing that. So all that's left to do is roll out the red carpet, you stare into the camera, and tell us what's on the horizon for Timo, if you can tell us about some of the uh, stuff in space for you. Oh, definitely. Um, again, with the, with the decline in voice in, in telecom, uh, there comes a point in time when you have to look at what you're doing and say, is this still viable? Am I still energized by it? And um, we, what we've seen over the last few years is the, is the rise of LEO constellations and satellite internet. It's in the newspapers quite a bit. It's being rolled out quite a bit, whether it's Starlink from Elon Musk or Project Cooper from Jeff Bezos, Lightspeed from Telesat here in Canada, OneWeb out of the UK. So that really got me interested in what was happening up in space. And I started to write about it on my blog. It ended up being the most looked at article that I'd ever written uh, by orders of magnitude. And I said, Hey, so there's something here. Mm -hmm. So I started digging into what's happening in the space sector and I got really excited. I 
it's, it's adjacent to telecom because literally a lot of what you're doing is putting a cell tower in the sky. Wow. Um, yes, there's earth observation and a lot of the climate change people are really happy about that. But the majority of the satellites going up are for communications. Um, so there's 5G standards. Previously, a lot of the satellites that were up there weren't necessarily compatible with terrestrial standards. The new satellites going up are making sure that they're 3GPP and 5G compatible. You're seeing the look, people considering putting data centers up into orbit uh, mm. because it's secure. Um, laser communication going back and forth. So I, I got really excited and I, I took a course on the business and economics of space with uh, a brilliant woman, Sinead O'Sullivan. Um, and so now I'm, I'm looking at maybe potentially having my next career in, uh, in the space industry whether it's bringing in some of the contacts from the telecom side, whether it's looking at potentially some of the financing options. Um, don't know yet, but it's, wow. it's, it's energizing me. So I'm having fun with it. <laughs> That's pretty exciting though. I, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. it I'm excited for you. And uh, I know everybody else will be looking forward to seeing it. Well, last question. I know we're running out of time, but last question. Would you take a trip to, let's say, the space station, International Space Station, if possible? Oh, in a heartbeat, if possible. I don't know All if right. I could afford it, but if, if somebody <laughs> offered me a trip, even just a suborbital, like uh, like like we were seeing lately, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm there. Sign me up. There you go. Okay, next time we're gonna see Timo, and uh, we'll do the interview in outer space. <laughs> <laughs> Timo, thanks for joining us today. Uh, to the rest of the audience. Make sure to like it, subscribe to us to keep up with everything. Do the whole social media, share, like, subscribe, and uh, to keep in the loop. We will see you the next go round. <laughs>